All right, you all ready to worship right there in your living room, in your home, gather the family together. Amen. Come on, get ready to move a little in, the, in your house. Hallelujah. Father, we thank you that you have risen and that you reign, Lord, forevermore. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Father. Come on, let's worship. Same power that crushed thee. 
risen, King Jesus, King Jesus, risen, risen, he's risen forever glorified, yeah, he's risen, risen, he's risen, King Jesus, King Jesus is alive. That's right. Go ahead and praise him right there in your home this morning. Hallelujah. You are alive. You are alive, Father. And we're so thankful. We're so glad, oh God, that you rose, Lord, that you rose and that you ascended and that you are alive. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We're forever grateful, Lord. Come on. Can you just give God thanks right there where you are?
lifted high forever he is risen he is alive he is alive yes he is forever 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 he is glorified forever forever he right right there where you are saying hallelujah Jesus is alive he's alive and well yes he is hallelujah father we thank you Lord God for victory this morning we thank you because of what you've done it is finished it is finished oh God and we know Lord God that that victory and that triumph that you had there that day God we have today and Father, we simply, we simply, Lord God, enter into that. We enter into that joy, that victory. We grab a hold of it this morning. Hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Amen. Well, why don't you go ahead and greet your family right there where you are. Amen. Hallelujah. Well, hello and welcome to Cliffdale's Resurrection Service. We love that you are joining us virtually to celebrate the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Listen, uh, before we go into anything, I want to read this scripture. It's Exodus chapter 22, 29 through 30. It says this, it says, You shall not delay to offer the first of your ripe produce and your juices, the firstborn of your sons, you shall give to me. Likewise, you shall do with your oxen and with your sheep. It shall be with its mother seven days, and on the eighth day you shall give it to me. Friends, listen, you know that we have been in the celebration time of first fruits, right? Preparing our first fruits, getting those first fruits ready. Um, and what a great opportunity we have now in this season to be able to not just give the first fruit of our finances, but to be able to give the first fruit of our time, the first fruit of our talents. Here we are celebrating the resurrection of the very first of the first of the first fruits, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. The Word of God says He is the first fruit of many. And now, today, we celebrate His resurrection. We celebrate the miracle of redemption. We celebrate the miracle of salvation. We celebrate what he has done, what he is doing, and we can even celebrate what we know he will do in faith. What a great day. What a wonderful day. Listen, I hope that you, before you even began to watch today, that you got dressed up in your Sunday best. That today you're getting ready to not just uh, worship the Lord and not just hear, but, but celebrate all that he has done. Listen, I want you to go ahead, prepare your first fruit offering. Go ahead and get it ready. Um, we are going to begin to receive those first fruit offerings. On This is the final Sunday that we're do, doing first fruits. And so we're going to get ready to receive those first fruit offerings. Um, but before we do, let me um, just encourage you in the ways that you can give. Number one, uh, you can tithe on our website. That's www.cliffdellalive.com. Number two, um, you can do the text to give, and that's nine one. You text nine one zero four nine nine four seven four nine. That's nine one zero four nine nine four seven. You can mail a check, as many of you have done, um, to Cliffdale Christian Center, 6427 Cliffdale Road, Fayetteville, North Carolina, 28314. You can drop your uh, tithes, your, your offerings, your first fruit gifts off at the daycare. Also, one of the things I'm hoping to do in the next week is to put a slot in the office door where you can, um, one of the mail slots, and to where you can just slip it into the office door um, and be able to give that way. Uh, that being said, go ahead and watch this tutorial on how you can give. All right.
right, go ahead and take those first fruit offerings if you have them. Lift them up. Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, God, I speak a blessing over each individual who is offering up the very best of the best, God, the very first of the first of the first fruits. God, I ask that you would take these gifts, that, God, you would use them to advance your kingdom, that, God, we would see your kingdom come, that we would see your will being done. Father, I thank you that you have afforded us this exciting moment to be able to give like we've never given before into your kingdom. Take these gifts, O God. Bless them, I pray. Bless with abundance, God, each giver, I pray. Father, I come against, in their lives, I come against the spirit of lack. I come against the spirit of uh, uh, of fear and worry and doubt. I say they will be strong. They will be courageous. That, Father, you will cause them to advance and go further and accomplish more in your kingdom for your glory, O God. In Jesus' name, amen. Once again, thank you for giving. Um, I want to go ahead and turn it over to Lou now with your tithes and offerings. Good morning, church family. Happy Resurrection Day. Brother Lewis here, I just want to encourage you in your giving today. Listen, God gave the best of what he had for us. And this is an opportunity for us to reciprocate. Listen, I want to encourage you today that as you give, you're mindful of the sacrifices that God made not fully knowing the impact it would have. He gave us an opportunity, just like he gave uh, Adam an opportunity to succeed in the garden before sin crept in. But then he gave us another opportunity in accepting uh, Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. And so um, today, I want you to understand that um, us giving is just a part of our living. Uh, especially as Christians. And so today as you give, uh, I want you to know that you're honoring God for the things and the sacrifices that he made so that we um, could yet live again. And so today I just ask that you use your heart. Don't give out of your lack. Um, Give out of your faith. Father, we come before you today. We're so grateful and thankful for the sacrifices that your son has made. And Lord, we're asking that um, you would continue to encourage the hearts of your people today, God, um, that we might be uh, mighty in you. And Father, that as we give, we not only advance our kingdom, uh, we not only advance your kingdom, um, but we also advance the ability to reach out to our community uh, and our church family as well. Father, we thank you uh, for the opportunity today um, to give. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, guys. Happy Resurrection Day. See y'all soon. Can I just say thank you for giving today? Thank you for giving to the Lord. Thank you for offering your first fruit offerings. Thank you. Listen, Cliffdale, you guys honor me. I, I am so honored to be your pastor. The way I see us going, listen, during this time of, you know, when it's just challenging, you guys going above and beyond, going further and farther, right? In order to connect, in order to connect socially, in order to, to meet and to talk, the phone calls that are being made, the text, all of these things, you guys are doing such a great and amazing job. I want to give you a couple of announcements before we jump into the Resurrection Woo Sunday Sermon. Uh, as I have announced and will continue to announce, every Saturday between the hours of 11 and 1, we're preparing dinners to hand out to our community. Last week we did like 250. We're planning on doing 250 again this week. Um, so if you would like to come out and volunteer, be a part of that, you can get with Miss Barbara Wilson. Or if you are an individual who is in need um, or know somebody, then let them know you know and come out and be a part of those meals that we are giving away. And plus, guys, listen, it's just fun to be able to see one another. It's fun to, uh, even at that time, to just be able to wave and, and say, hey, you know what, it's good to see you. Um, and one of the things I've begun to do is when individuals drop their, their tithe checks by, is I've begun to stop and say, hey, you know what, I want to pray a special blessing over you. Because listen, it's not just like you're here on Sunday and it's, it's a thing where, where, where it's easy to do. No, it's a thing where, where you've got to go out of your way in order to be able to give. And you guys are doing it. Ah, I love it. And I love, listen, I love that God gave me the word at the beginning of the year about the storm and how we need to prepare now for the storm, because we're in the storm. You guys have been trained for this. And listen, you're doing a great job. We're winning this battle. We are still spreading the gospel and seeing the kingdom advance, even though things are trying to be so constraining. Enough of that. Let me go ahead and go, like I said, into these announcements, so you can be a part of that on Saturday. Also, keep in mind the food bank is giving away food. 
Um, every Wednesday uh, between 5 and 6 o'clock, you can come out and uh, if you need to volunteer, you can get with Miss Judy. Um, or if you're an individual, again, who is in need, um, you just pull up right behind the hangar. There's a long line of cars. We put the food in your trunk and you're able to go. It's like I've said, you've heard me say, I'll say it again. We are in compliance with all the recommendations of our uh, local authorities, our regional, and state, and uh, federal uh, uh, things between the gloves and the masks and uh, the, the hand sanitizer, all of these things, the six-foot rule, we are in compliance with every one of those recommendations. I say that, number one, for, for, for safety purposes, but also so that you know, listen, we're going above and beyond in order to meet the needs of the individuals in our community, and there's not a whole lot of people doing that. And I thank God that we're one of the ones who are stepping up and saying, you know what, we're going to do all that we can do in this season and in this time. Um, oh, listen, cool, cool, cool thing also. Uh, immediately following this service, we're going to do a, a meet the pastor, a meet and greet, a, vir a virtual meet the pastor uh, <clears throat> time. Um, we're going to do it via Zoom. Um, so there's going to be in the... Um, in the comments below, um, there's going to be the link that you can click on in order to be a part of that meeting. Now, it is an AV, so it is both audio and visual. Um, and so if you don't want your you know, picture to be up there, then you're going to have to unclick the camera or whatever. Um, but, but jump on that link and come out and meet us. It's only going to take about 10, maybe 15 minutes. Um, just want to talk with you personally, face-to-face, -face, and uh, share with you, maybe pray with you. Um, and so, yeah, come out and be a part of that virtual meeting. Like I said, all you're going to have to do is click the link and then follow the prompts, and you'll be able to meet with us um, immediately after service. Um, today. Uh, that's our meet in the foyer. Let's see what else we got on the announcements. <clears throat> Oh, also, um, along with this and the other virtual material that we're putting out, any prayer requests, uh, any testimonies that you have, anything like that, be sure that you are putting them uh, on the thread below so that we can continue to keep individuals lifted up in prayer and we can also um, rejoice in the testimonies that you are giving. Also, if you're a part of the Ministry of Helps, last announcement, I promise, if you are a part of the Ministry of Helps, um, then we're putting together a Ministry of Helps uh, meeting virtually um, that this upcoming week. So be looking for an email uh, where you'll be invited out to be a part of that uh, MOH virtual meeting. Hallelujah. Um, so yeah, good stuff. A lot of stuff going on. Um, let's go ahead and uh, jump into woo, the Word today. Turn in your Bibles with me, if you would, to John chapter 20. And we're going to read at some length, uh, this is the day of resurrection. Um, and so we're going to read John 20, 1 through 20. Keep in mind that the book of John, the prof, or not the, prof, the, the apostle, the disciple who Jesus loved, uh, and often in this portion of scripture, he is referring to himself in that context. John, 1, or John 20, verse 1 through 20. Now, the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb early while it was still dark, and saw that the stone had been taken away from the tomb. Then she ran and came to Simon Peter and to the other disciple whom Jesus loved. There it is, John speaking of himself, right? And said to them, They have taken away the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. Peter therefore went out and the other disciple and were going to the tomb. So they both ran together. And the other disciple outran Peter. I got to wonder about Peter and John's, their whole relationship. It seems like a little bit of, uh, you know, I'm, I'm just saying I outran Peter, right? So uh, we see, uh, so they both ran together. And the other disciple outran Peter and came to the tomb first. And he, stooping down and looking in, saw the linen clothes lying there. Yet he did not go in. Then Simon Peter came, following him, and went to the tomb and saw the linen clothes lying there. And the handkerchief at, uh, that had been on his head, not lying with the clothes, but folded together and placed by itself. Then the other disciple, who had come to the tomb first, again, John, um, then the other disciple who had come to the tomb first went also, and he saw and believed. For as yet they did not know the scripture that he must rise again from the dead. Then the, disciple, the disciples went away again to their own houses. But Mary stood outside the tomb weeping, and as she wept, she stooped down and looked into the tomb. And she saw the two angels, or she saw two angels sitting, one at the head and the other at the feet, where the body of Jesus had been laying. Then they said to her, said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? And she said to them, Because they have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. 
Now when she had said this, she turned around and she saw Jesus standing there and she did not know that it was Jesus. And Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? She, supposing him to be a gardener, said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him and I will take him away. And Jesus said to Mary, or Jesus said to her, Mary, she turned and she said to him, Rabboni, which is to say teacher. Jesus said to her, do not cling to me, for I have not yet ascended to my father, but go to my brethren and say to them that I am ascending to my father and to your father and to my God and to your God. And Mary Magdalene came and told the disciples what she had seen or that she had seen the Lord and that he had spoken these things to her. Then that same day at the evening, being the first day of the week, when the doors were shut, where the disciples were, assembled for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood in the midst and said to them, Peace be with you. And he, uh, when he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. Heavenly Father, we come before you now. In the name of Jesus and God, we just open our heart on this Resurrection Sunday to receive from your word. God, to rejoice in the resurrection, to rejoice in our salvation, to rejoice in the abundant, wonderful, good blessing that you have given to us. Father, we love you. We bless you now in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, friends, as I consider this story... We, of course, know leading up, Jesus uh, lived, he died, had been crucified, that he had been buried. And here we are on the third day. Mary Magdalene comes uh, to bring spices to the tomb of Jesus. As she comes, she finds that he's not there. She runs back to the disciples, uh, just frantic, scared, worried, afraid. Uh, Even looking at portions of this scripture, uh, even to the point of frantic a fear, perhaps panic, um, to the point where she doesn't even recognize Jesus when, when he appears to her. The disciples, they leave, uh, they run out. John, of course, saying he can outrun Peter, right? He runs in front of Peter, stoops in, pro- probably feeling a great deal of fear, apprehension, worry, doubt, not knowing what was taking place, not knowing what was going on. Peter, being who Peter is, pushes past John into the tomb sees the graves closed, sees the handkerchief, but does not see Jesus. Who did they come to seek? Who did they come to find? (laughs) Jesus. Why do you seek the living among the dead? A wondering, worrying, doubting. What is going on here? Finally, John enters in to the tomb also, and they find the tomb empty. Probably just full of confusion, wonder, what is going on? What is taking place, right? The disciples go back to the house, probably having these worrisome discussions, not understanding, not knowing, not getting it at this point. For John even said, he said, we didn't even know at this point the Scripture that he would be raised from the dead. (laughs) They depart. Mary remains still frantic, still scared, still worried. Again, uh, she almost feels like, as I'm reading this, that she's gotten to almost a mantic position mentally not knowing not understanding right finally she what does it say she sees two angels one at the foot and one at the head where jesus body had been laying and then she sees jesus again not wrecking tears in her eyes and i can see it right here she is she is weeping bitterly again fear and doubt and wonder and worry just emotionally overwhelmed by all of these things and this is when jesus says to her, uh, you know, who are you, who are you, what are you seeking here? Mary, you know, (laughs) thanking him to be a gardener, this shows us where Mary is at, um, says, do you know where they've laid my Lord? Do you know where they've placed him? Listen, just tell me where he is. I will go get him. And then Jesus simply says her name, Mary. I mean, just at that moment, right? Mary. And suddenly, instantly, here she is in a place where she recognizes Jesus, where she knows that it is that it is him. <laughs> Rabboni, Rabbi, teacher. And he says, Don't cling to me. Don't don't hold close to me right now. For I must ascend to my father. And and so she leaves that place. 
She goes and she tells the disciples all that she had seen, all that had taken place, everything that had gone on. <laughs> the disciples, again, probably thinking, look, Mary, you're, you're, you're just half crazy right now. We saw you mantic. We saw you scared. We saw you panic, right? And, and now you say you saw Jesus. Mary, you're probably seeing things. But then later on that day, and I love the, I love the visual picture. I love to imagine this in my mind. Because there they are all sitting around toward the end of uh, the Sunday, the, the first day of the week, toward the end of Resurrection Sunday. It is in the evening. The doors are closed. The windows are barred. All of these things are taking place, right? And what happens? What happens? What happens? Boom! Jesus comes and just mm, stands right in front of them. Just like that. <laughs> Amazement. Suddenly their fear, their doubt, their wondering, their worry vanishes. Here they are now in a place of awe and awesome amazement. The one we thought was dead is alive, and he is alive forevermore. The completion of the plan of redemption having taken place. The offering of salvation, the purchase, the buyback for sin accomplished. A plan that had been in motion for thousands of years. All the way from the Garden of Eden, when we know God created the heavens and the earth. The Word of God says that the earth was without form, that it was completely void, and that the Spirit of God hovered over the face of the deep. These things transpired, they happened. We know the stars and the, the moon and the, the sky, God creating the firmament and the animals, and then finally the, the top of His creation is mankind. Oh, we know this story. I, I took you this past Wednesday, and we, we walked through the whole story of creation, the whole, the whole story of, uh, well, really, history. A man, he falls into sin. God saying, because you've done this, and listen, like, and I, told, I said this on Wednesday, this was not a plan B for God. God did not, oh, well, now that man has sinned, I, must, I better come up with a plan B because man has just messed everything up. No, God knew that this was going to transpire. Dare I say that this was even part of the plan. He had anticipated, he knew that this was going to happen. He knew that man would fall, that man would sin, that Adam and Eve would get expelled. He knew that, that generations later, that, that he would have to uh, wipe out the face of the earth and Noah would be in the ark. He knew that generations later, that he would choose a man hand-selected among all the peoples of the earth, and that man would be named Abraham. And then he would choose that man, and he would call that man to a place where he would not even know where to go yet, but yet he would begin to go. He would tell that man because of his faith, because of his, that these things were considered like righteousness, that, 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 that because he had done these things, that he was going to make his generations like the sand of the seashore, like the, the stars of the night sky. Abraham, of course, gives birth to the son of promise, Isaac. Isaac has Jacob, and Jacob has 12 sons. These 12 sons formed the 12 tribes of Israel, but one of those sons was sold into slavery, held in captivity, and brought to Egypt. Oh, spent some time in Egypt and did well at the house of Potiphar. But then Potiphar's wife had a little crush on him, told a lie. Boom, next thing you know, where's he at? In jail. There he is, you know, when he had had dreams and aspirations of ruling his father's entire household. And now he is in an Egyptian prison, an Egyptian jailhouse. He stays there for an amount of time. Uh, dreams, dreams, visions, all of these things. But he, he is brought to a place of prominence and leadership. As a matter of fact, he is so prominent in such leadership that he brings his entire family. And God blesses the children of Israel, those 12 tribes. They multiply, they increase in power, even to the point where Pharaoh uh, says, look, we're going to have to do something here. We're going to have to begin to subjugate these people. We're going to have to begin to put these people down. They try, and God still blesses them. But God heard the cries of his people, and he called the deliverer Moses. Moses was one of the children uh, who just happened, right? <laughs> Not just happened. God ordained providence, right? Wasn't lucky at all. God ordained providence, had chosen this individual, and because he did, he was put in a basket, sent down the Nile, found by Pharaoh's daughter, raised by her, right? Finally, at the end of the day, raised in the Egyptian court, but sent out because he murders not just, uh, uh, well, he, not, he murders an Egyptian, so he runs for his life, finds himself, the word of God says, on the backside of the desert. 
Here he is tending sheep for 40 years on the backside of the desert. And what takes place? He sees an odd thing up on the mountaintops. He sees a fire. He sees a bush that is consumed with fire but not consumed. It yet burned and it yet burned and it yet burned and it yet burned. And understand, in the desert, things do sometimes simply catch fire. But the fact that the bush did not burn down was what was odd. He goes to the bush. The voice of God begins to speak with, or to him. Moses. Remove your shoes, for the place where you are standing is holy ground. Moses removes his shoes. God begins to lay out the plan. I've called you to be a deliverer to my people. I've called you to to, to go to them. I want you to speak to Pharaoh, but I can't speak, Lord. Then bring your brother Aaron with you. And you're going to speak to him, and you're going to deliver my people. And through you, I'm going to cause plagues to come down upon Egypt. Moses goes to Pharaoh. Let my people go. No, right? (laughs) First blank. Let my people go. No, continues, continues, continues. Everything from water turning to blood and (laughs) frogs and flies and locusts and uh, all of these things transpired. Finally, the death of all the firstborn of the Egyptians, the Egyptians' cattle, the Egyptians' sheep, the Egyptians' even their children. And what we celebrated just a few days ago, the Passover, that was the celebration of when the death angel passed over the children of Israel, where the firstborn of their cattle, the firstborn of their sheep, the firstborn of their womb was passed over, and the death angel did not touch them. That was a type and a shadow of what Jesus would do, that Passover lamb sacrificed so that death would not come to the house. We see this transpiring. Finally, Pharaoh lets the people go. God leads them to an awkward, weird place, a place where you got mountains on one side and the Red Sea on the other. He brings them to this place. Moses lifts up his rod. We know this story. The seas part. The children of Israel walk through on dry ground. The army of Pharaoh tries to pursue, tries to come after them. Unable to do so, the waters close, completely annihilating the Egyptian army. God's people watch the the wondrous works of God's almighty hand. They they see water come from the rock. They see the pillar of fire. They see uh, the pillar of cloud. These things transpiring, these things taking place. They get to to the land of promise, the land that is flowing with milk and honey. And they believe the bad report, right? The ten spies that came back and gave the bad report, they believed that report. And for their disobedience, they spend the next 40 years, an entire generation, in the wilderness. But 40 years later, they raised up another generation, a new generation, Joshua generation. They come to the Jordan River. Just as the priests begin to step into the Jordan River, the priests carrying the Ark of the Covenant, as this transpires, as this takes place, the waters of the Jordan gather in a heap. The children of Israel, once again, walk through on dry ground. Joshua takes Jericho. He takes most of the country, most of the nations, the places he doesn't take. The Word of God says he doesn't take them because the wild animals would come and be able to uh, take over if they had taken those places. Uh, This enters the time in Israel's history, right, of the judges. uh, Great judges like Samson and Gideon and uh, Ehud and just each one of these. And, And what would take place is a generation would rise up and repent they would do well, and when the judge would die, they would once again go back to their bales and their astros. God would allow devastation to take place. They would repent. God would raise up a judge. Do again. Do again. Until finally the people got to the point where what? They wanted a king. They cried out for a king. God gave them the king who began to establish the nation, King Saul. We know, of course, King Saul's reign went into King David's. And I'm just running through a very brief history of, of what is taking place, leading us to... The birth, life, death of Jesus Christ, resurrection, ascension. We see the days of the kings, King Saul, King David, King Solomon. But after King Solomon, because he had, he had gone away into sin, God divided the kingdoms into the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom. The kingdom of Israel and the kingdom of Judea. The, the, uh, the, uh, uh, the, 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 the line of Judah. Understand that that line is so very important because that's where we get uh, Judean from. It's where we get the word Jew from. Um, All of these come from that Judah, that Judean kingdom. Um, They're separated, but I mean, 
the people start to enter into a time of sin. We enter into the days of the prophets. Uh, they are at a point where they are exiled and we hear about the great stories of guys like Daniel and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. We read about uh, individuals like Nehemiah who come back and rebuild the walls of the city. Uh, Guys like Ezra, Haggai, all of these individuals. And then around about 60 years before the time of Christ, I believe 63 years, there is a a, a Roman, I don't want to call uh, emperor because he was not an emperor, but a Roman general named Pompey who came and seized Syria. A year later, taking Jerusalem. And from this time forward, the Syrian coast, the, 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 everybody in, in like the Palestinian region was under the Ro- Roman rule. Um, enter the great general Julius Caesar, right? Um, he is uh, 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 the, the emperor of emperors. After him, we know, the great Augustus um, is, is made emperor of Rome. And it is during the time of Augustus that Jesus is born. It's during his reign that the king of kings is birthed to a young virgin named Mary in a small town named Bethlehem. And of course, we know these stories. But can I tell you, I love these stories and I love telling you these stories. Birthed in Bethlehem. He lives, he's raised up, and around his 30 something year, he is launched into ministry. He begins to turn the world literally upside down. Uh, using the, the, those who perhaps are, are outside of normal societal, you know, fishermen and tax collectors. Um, he begins to set free prostitutes and uh, begins to, 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 to heal beggars. I mean, blind eyes, deaf ear, lame, dead, doesn't matter. Demon possessed, he takes on all of it, feeds 5,000, calm storms. I mean, just tears it up, Right? And it all leads to this point. Last Sunday, we celebrated Palm Sunday. It all leads to this point where on Palm Sunday, he has displayed such power, such strength, such authority, that as he comes into Jerusalem, the people are throwing palm fronds before him. He is entering like an emperor, like a king. They're declaring, Hosanna! Hosanna in the highest! Hosanna! Hosanna in the highest! They're acknowledging him, the desire for him to be their king, and they thought he would be. They thought he would enter into Jerusalem and display the same power, display the the same miracles that he had been displaying, but they didn't get it. They didn't understand. Because what he was establishing was not an earthly kingdom, but it was an eternal kingdom. And there was only one way for that eternal kingdom to be established. There must be a purchase made. Something must be bought. And he was willing to pay the price. He was willing to pay the price, what it costs for redemption. Jesus enters Jerusalem and, I mean, just begins turning over temple tables, you know, begins making the declarations of God, begins to stir up, go against the grain. So much so that it gets to the point where the leaders, the the high priests, these individuals, they begin to seek to take Jesus' life. Matter of fact, they get with one of the disciples, Judas, the treasure keeper, right? And says, listen, if you're willing to betray Jesus, then we will pay you 30 pieces of silver. Judas, uh, probably in the beginning, no, I can't do it. I love Jesus. I love Jesus. I love Jesus. But man, this just kept eating at him. And Judas probably believed that Jesus was the Son of God, but he believed that, you know, that he was going to establish the earth, that Jesus could take it, that this wasn't going to happen, that he wasn't going to be crucified or any of these things. No, he probably believed that everything was going to be all right. Huh? Everything was all right, though, wasn't it? Jesus, on what's called Monday Thursday, right, <clears throat> celebrates the Passover with his disciples, establishes the covenant that we know as communion. Uh, we're going to celebrate communion at the end of this service today, so I hope you've got your elements ready. If you don't, prepare them when it's time. He begins to establish these things, and after he establishes the, the, the covenant of communion with his disciples, he washes their feet, and then finally at the end of the evening, the, the celebration kind of coming to a conclusion, they go out to the garden called Gethsemane. We know the story. Jesus enters the garden. He goes about a stone's throw away from his disciples, and he takes Peter, James, and John, that stone's throw away, and then he says to them, you wait here while I go pray. He said, watch, be alert, be awake, be attentive, and pray. He goes away, and he falls, begins to cry out to God, 
Father, if there's any way for this cup to pass from me, let it be so. Nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. Your will be accomplished. He comes back to his disciples. Yeah, you know, they're asleep. He wakes them. Could you not wait? Could you not pray with me? Could you not be attentive for even an hour? Huh. Watch and pray, he tells them once again, and he goes off to pray. Father, if there's any way for this cup to pass from me, sweating drops of blood, let it be so. Returns to his disciples, they're still, they, they went back to sleep. So he goes once again, doesn't wake him up that time, and comes back. As he comes back, as he is returning, I mean, the wee hours, right, of the morning on Friday, or late, I mean, I, I don't know, it doesn't say in Scripture what time it was. We know that it was uh, very late on Moondy Thursday or very early, early Friday. But either way, at this time, there's a gang of men <clears throat> arriving at the garden. Judas knew exactly where to go. He knew the spot where Jesus would be. He walks up to the one he had called rabbi, the one he had called master, and he kisses him on, a che- on the cheek. And Jesus says, is it with a kiss that you betray the Son of God? Woo! Man, they come and they seize Jesus. One of the disciples takes a sword and lops off the servant of the high priest, his ear. And Jesus said, if you live by the sword, you will die by the sword. Put it away. He spoke to the servant. He said, permit me to do this. He lays his hand on the servant. The servant is healed. Hmm. Then he's taken away before the high council. He is, uh, accusations are made against him. But the Jewish people were not permitted to execute, perform their own executions. So they must go to their Roman authority. They Finally, they, they make the decision after these trumped up accusations, after being smacked and asked if he was the son of God. After all these things taken place, after Peter betrayed, he goes before Pilate. And Pilate says, what do I have to do with this? This guy seems like a, a, you know, a good guy, a just guy, a righteous man. But they declared no. And Pilate said, I'm not going to have anything to do with it. I'm going to send him to Herod. You deal with your own stuff. They bring him to Herod. Herod looks at him and asks him to do some miracles, show him some stuff. And Jesus, of course, does not. And so Herod sends him back to Pilate. Pilate, realizing that the people who had cried out Hosanna are now crying out, crucify him. And as was his custom during these times, during this season... Pilate would give away or let go free one of the individuals who's in prison. Would you have me give you Jesus or Barabbas, he asks. Barabbas being one who had caused and begun many revolts and murders and all sorts of, uh, I'll say, treachery, right? Give us Barabbas, they shout. And what of Jesus? Crucify him. Hosanna. Crucify him. Hosanna. Crucify him. Woo. We know the story. Jesus is scourged. He's beaten, beard ripped out, punched, flogged, taken to a hill they call the skull. Keep in mind, without these things coming, as you've heard me say, they have come to pass, but they had to come in order to pass. They did have to come to that point, to that place. They did have to happen. There cannot be redemption without the purchase. There can't be the purchase without the price. There can't be the price unless we're willing to pay it. Jesus was willing to pay it, and this was the payment that was due. Laid upon that cross, hands nailed. The cross placed upright. Hmm. People began to walk by him and mock. You saved others, son of God, save yourself. I cringe at those words. Ah, finally, he lifts his head to heaven and he declares, Father, why hast thou forsaken me? In that moment, the eternal union that had existed from eternity past was severed, separated. The father looking at his son saying, I can no longer look at you. I can no longer be a part of what you're a part of. I can no longer do this. I am holy, I am pure, and you are carrying, you have become something that I cannot even look at. I cannot even behold. I cannot be a part of the sin, the lust, the stench, these things. Mm. Father's rage, wrath, 
pour it out. Blah! Hmm. Woo! Father, why have you forsaken me? Finally, Jesus hangs his head and says, Into your hands I commit my spirit, and he dies. One of the Pharisees, the rulers, uh, a righteous man, the Word of God says, named Joseph of Arimathea, takes the body of Jesus and places it in a tomb in his garden. And this is the place where we pick up the story of Mary. This is the place where Mary comes to. This is the place where she sees Jesus. This is where she discovers the empty tomb at that sunrise on that resurrection Sunday. It is in that moment, right, that redemption has taken place. It is in that moment that salvation has taken place, that we who need to be redeemed, redeemed, that we who the wages of sin is death, the one that the enemy has come to kill, to steal, and to destroy, that we have been afforded the opportunity to live in the kingdom of our heavenly Father. Everything. From the moment that he said, let there be light. To now hmm. had led to that moment. Had led to the moment of the resurrection of the Son of God. But listen, my friends, that wasn't the end of the plan. That is not where the plan concludes. That is not where the plan ends, but it continues on. Because just as Jesus lived and died and now he has risen from the dead, so he would ascend and he would send us the promise of the Father. Jesus spends 40 days, the next 40 days, with his disciples, ministering to them, talking to them, uh, just being with them, sharing, loving, caring for them. And then he begins to ascend. And what does he do? Well, let's turn there. Acts chapter 1. Jesus speaking, right, in verse 8. And it says this in Acts 1, 8, and I'm going to read through 11. But you shall receive power when that the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem, and all of Judea, and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Now when he had spoken these things, while they yet watched, he was taken up in a cloud, and received him out of their sight. And while they stood, or as they looked steadfastly toward heaven, as he had went up, behold, two men stood in white apparel, who also said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus, who was taken up, from you into heaven will also come in like manner as you saw him go into heaven. My friends, my friends, my friends, there he is. He's caught up, but he said, listen, if you remain, if you tarry in Jerusalem, remain in that place, then you're going to receive the promise of the Father. And through this promise, you're going to receive the power, this dunamis power. And I want to read to you. Well, not yet. Don't want to get too far in front of myself. Turn with me to Romans 1, 16 and 17. Romans 1, 16 and 17. We're going to go back to Acts, but first let's talk about Romans, and then we'll jump back, because I want to use both these scriptures together. Romans 1, 16 says this, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation, for everyone who believes, for the Jew first, and then also for the Greek. For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. The word in Romans for power and the word in Acts for power are both the very same word. It is the word dunamis, dynamo, what we get our word dynamite from. You've heard me preach this, but I've got to just reiterate it because it's it's imperative for the place where we're going today. Uh, Dunamis is strength, power, ability, inherent power. The power residing in a thing by virtue of its nature or which a person or thing exerts or puts forth the power of performing miracles, moral power, an excellent soul, the power of influence that belongs in riches, wealth, power, um, (coughs) and resources arising from numbers, power consisting in or resting upon armies, force, forces, or hosts. That is the power of God. That's the power of God unto salvation. That is the dunamis power that we receive when we receive the Holy Spirit. We receive the power of Almighty God. It comes and rests on us. Hmm. Jesus says, as he is, you know, just about to go up, but you shall receive the power, or you shall receive power when that the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And not only are you going to receive power when that the Holy Spirit comes upon you, but this power is going to enable you to be my witnesses. Now follow me, because we're going somewhere. That word witnesses is the word martyr, the word we get martyr from. 
That word is defined as this, a witness, a martyr, one who records something. Those who, after the example, have proven, uh, the, have proved the strength and genuineness of their faith in Christ by going forth even to the point of a violent death. You shall receive, follow me, you shall receive this dunamis power that will enable you to even be a witness, to be a Listen, you will be able to undergo such extreme circumstances even to the point of a violent death because that's the power you have. That is the strength, the ability that you have, that you've been given when you receive the Holy Spirit. And understand this, let's go back, let's go back, let's go back. This is the same power that we have that we're not ashamed of. I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ for it is what? It is the power of God unto salvation. It is that dunamis power, the power of armies and morality and strength and goodness and righteousness. It is that power. It is that power that we have been given, that we can take hold of. And it is in that power, right, 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 that we have the ability to even go to the point of a violent death. It it, it is that level of strength, that level of fortitude, Dare I say, we could even call ourselves the modern-day martyrs. Are those individuals who are going to, willing to go to whatever length they have to go to, to push and to fight and to spit and to scream and to rest, to trust and to rely and to have faith and all of these things, to give the very best. Isn't this Resurrection Sunday? Isn't this the very last day of our first fruits giving? Listen, I desire to be a person who goes further, farther. I want to push myself. I want to push us to do things we have never done before because I realize I've tapped into a little bit of that dunamis power, but I don't have all of it. I've tapped into a little bit of what it is to be that martyr and to go and to push and to accomplish and to sweat and to bleed, right? I've done a little bit of that, but I want to do more because I realize that God has given me his salvation. Woo! For it is the power, the dunamis power of God unto salvation. The word sotore. Salvation. Deliverance. Preservation. Safety. Free from molestation of enemies. In an ethical sense, which can includes to the soul and safety or salvation, the messianic salvation, salvation as a present, as a present, listen, as a present possession of all Christians. Salvation is a present possession that you can have today. What does that mean? What does it mean? What does it mean? It means that in salvation today, you can have deliverance, preservation, safety. It means that you can be free, um, you can be free from the molestation of your enemies. Friends, I want to take hold of that salvation. I desire to be an individual who walks out what it is to be a Christian daily. What does it mean to be a Christian? To be Christ-like. That is what it means. What does it mean to be saved, to have salvation? It means, listen, it means to have that level of strength and power and authority and goodness and righteousness and justice, these things on the inside of us, to live, to die, to push, to go, right? All the give, all that we can possibly give to indeed be that modern day martyr. Hear me, hear me, hear me. I had someone ask me just a couple of days ago, right? Pastor Josh, you're not one of those greasy, grace, you know, word of faith, prosperity preachers. And at first I was like, oh, no, 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 I'm not. And then I started thinking about it. I'm like, wait a minute. Let me, let me think about this for a second. Do I believe in grace? Oh, man. God's riches at Christ's expense. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I guess maybe, yeah, I'm that grace preacher. Man, hard confessions. Oh, what about that word of faith guy? Josh, are you without word of Oh, goodness. Do I believe that I can say to that mountain to be removed and cast into the sea that it's going to happen? Yeah, yeah. Guilty. Do I believe that when I lay hands on the sick that they'll be healed? Yeah, yeah, I believe that too. Do I believe that I have the opportunity and the ability to see the dead rise and the, the mute speak and the blind see? Yes, yeah, yeah. Man, I guess I, guess I am. Goodness sake. Oh, what about one of those prosperity preachers? Pastor Josh, you one of those prosperity preachers? Wait a second, friend. We just read what salvation is. It is that deliverance. It is that preservation. As a matter of fact, John 3, 16 and 17 says this, and I want to I just bring this home. For God so loved the world, we know it, right? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, 
that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world might be saved, saved, saved through him. Friends, I believe prosperity is found in salvation. The word saved there is the same word, same derivative of the same derivative of the word as sotore, and this one is sozo. And it means to save, it means to deliver, it means to protect, it means to heal, preserve, save, to do well, to be whole. It means to save, to keep safe and sound, rescue from danger and destruction. It means to save from suffering, from one suffering, from disease, to make well, to heal, to restore, to help. It means to preserve one from danger or destruction, to save and to rescue. It means to save in a technical sense or biblical sense. It means to save from the evils which obstruct the reception of the messianic deliverance. My friends, listen. I desire to be an individual who is walking out my salvation daily. Why? Because my salvation, it keeps me safe. It preserves me. My salvation keeps me well. It keeps uh, me healthy. It is to do well. It keeps me from that destruction. And listen, there is an enemy who is very real. His name is the devil, the liar, Satan, Lucifer. Listen, he is the one who has come to kill, to steal, and to destroy. He is the one that desires to see each one of us dead, buried, gone, and burning in hell. But my friends, he is the one who is also the great deceiver. And Jesus Christ came 2,000 years ago so that we would not have to undergo that destruction. He allowed his blood to be shed, his body to be broken, so that we might have salvation. So am I a prosperity preacher? Yeah, because I believe that salvation is prosperous. I believe that it's full of faith. I believe it's full of grace and strength and goodness. I believe that I can walk out my salvation daily with fear and trembling. Why, 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 why with fear and trembling? Is it because I'm scared of sin? No. Is it because I'm scared of Satan? No. Hear me, friends. That joker ain't got nothing. He ain't got nothing on Jesus. And I'm partnered with the biggest of the big and the bestest of the best. Am I scared of sickness or disease or difficulties? No. The storm? No. I work out my own salvation daily with fear and trembling because I have a little bit of knowledge as to the price that was paid so I could obtain it. I have an inkling, a small understanding of the body that was broken of the blood that was shed so I might have that salvation. I seek the prosperity, the health, the healing. I have faith. I believe. I reach. I fight. I run to obtain what Christ purchased for me. Why? Why? Because he considers you and I valuable enough to pay that price. So why would we leave that gift on the shelf if he paid such a precious price for it? Oh, Father, we love you. God, we bless you today. And Father, I just ask in the name of Jesus, let us be being a people who would work out our own salvation daily. Oh, Lord, Hmm. let us come to a greater realization of the price that was paid so that we might have that grace, have that faith, have that prosperity, have that salvation, God, and the injustice we do by not walking out that salvation. God, the injustice we do by not living that life that you paid for us, that you bought for us, that you redeemed for us. So, Father, let us take hold of that promised salvation. Let us live in your victory. Heavenly Father, daily, 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 let us walk what it is to be a Christian, to be Christ-like. Let us walk that out. Humbly, God, trying, (laughs) trying, pushing, doing. Um, So we might say, this is what it looks like to be saved. This is what it looks like to be a Christian, Christ-like, a follower, a disciple of the one who is the way, 
and the truth and the life. Father, we love you now. We bless you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen, friends. Listen, go ahead and uh, prepare your communion elements. I'm going to invite Amber and the kids to come on up as we uh, are going to get ready to partake of communion together. Happy Resurrection Sunday! We love you and we miss you! Bye! Hi, family! Hello, y'all! Happy Resurrection Sunday to you all! And remember, Jesus is alive! Keep that in your heart. We love you and we miss you. And we'll see you soon. Hello, Pastor Andrew Vomwald here. And I want to wish you a very happy Resurrection Sunday. And to remind you that nothing, not death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. May you have a happy and blessed Resurrection Sunday. Happy Resurrection Sunday from the Baumwolf family. We love you and God bless you. Hey everybody, this is Brother Brad and Melinda, and we want to wish you a happy Resurrection Sunday, and look forward to seeing you in a couple of weeks. We love you guys. Bye. Happy Resurrection Sunday, Cliffdale. Hi, family. We love you so much, and we miss you guys so much. We're so sorry that we're not able to meet together to celebrate our risen Savior on this Resurrection Sunday, but we're sending all of our love out to you. We are Cliffdale. We are Ecclesia. We miss you guys, but we just want to say with all our heart, from the bottom of our hearts, we love you so much, and we really want to wish you a happy, happy Resurrection, Resurrection Sunday. Sunday. Love you yeah, guys. Love you. Ah, bye. Happy Resurrection, Happy Resurrection Day. Day. From the winds, we're sitting here all quarantined in our house, um, ready to get out. But we can't stay in safe, social distancing. But we wanted to say uh, greetings. We miss you guys. Um, we're looking forward to the time when we can see you guys and you guys can meet Mr. Right here. Baby Israel, if he opens his eyes for you guys, he might not. He's sleep yeah, he's sleep. Sleep. He's All right. So, we again, we love you guys. Have, greetings. Um, keep, you know, worshiping and everything. Keep it keep it going. All right. Again, we love you. Bye-bye. Hi, this is Deanna wishing everyone a happy Resurrection Sunday. And this is Alayla. Alayla, say hi. <laughs> say hi everybody hi, <laughs> and this is Skylar Skylar say hi Skylar come here say hi no okay well that's it happy 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 resurrection Sunday and uh, stay safe love you guys mwah blow kiss blow kisses mwah <laughs> everybody it's brother Lewis again you know we are coming upon resurrection day and I hear a lot of you are struggling with this social distancing um, but until you have socially distanced yourself for three days and then made a comeback, I really don't want to hear about it. And so I am grateful and thankful to Jesus for what he's done for us, the sacrifices that he's made, things that we will never understand fully. But here's what I do know. As we go into uh, this Resurrection Sunday, um, we are about to embark upon something that has never been done by the entire world. We are going to celebrate virtually. Isn't that an amazing thing? Who would have ever thought that in a million years we'd be celebrating the resurrection of Jesus Christ virtually? But guess what? It still means that we're a community and that we're a community of believers. And so please, without fail, join us this Sunday as we celebrate the resurrection of the risen King. Listen guys, I love you. Celebrate with us. Can't wait to see you. God bless. Hey, Cliffdale family. Hey, Cliffdale fam. We just wanted to come and tell you guys, happy Resurrection Sunday. Sunday. And we hope that you guys are being obedient. Stay in the house. Love your family. Enjoy this time together. Yeah. Yes. Yes, this, this, this could be a blessing. Some, you know, hey, again, it's family time. Play, you know, for those who may not be playing board games or talking because families don't talk like they used to a lot of times. Hey, you know what? 
to take advantage of it. God is still in control. And uh, on this Resurrection Sunday, we just want to say we love you, we miss you, and we know that we'll be together soon because one thing we know is that God answers prayer. And amen. I know a lot of us are praying. Yes, amen. So, so this, this coronavirus is not bigger than God, okay? And uh, Jesus paid the price for it all, so we claiming the victory in it. Amen. Amen. All right. And Cliffdale Strong. Pastor Orlando, my muscle gonna look better soon. <laughs> well, welcome back um, for another Communion Sunday with the Happy Goodmans. Woo! We good even morning, dressed morning. up for you this morning because it is Resurrection Sunday. We pray that you are having a very excellent and a happy Resurrection Sunday. Once more, it's my opportunity and honor to share with you about communion. You know, communion on Easter is special because it's the heart of everything we celebrate on Resurrection Sunday. Yet here right now in the midst of all that is going on in our world, communion on Easter is even more significant. It harkens back to the first Passover when the Israelites painted their doorposts with the blood of a lamb and ate unleavened bread and waited for the angel of death to pass over their homes. They were led out of slavery and depression. Jesus celebrates Passover with his disciples at the Last Supper and shows them that he has come to fulfill these things. He is the lamb whose blood is spilled so that death will pass over us. He lays down his own life so that we can be freed from the slavery of our own sin. What an amazing time to be commemorating these events. The Passover lamb, Jesus, the lamb of God. Dark times that surround us but do not consume us. We have a hope in his death, burial, and resurrection. Dark times don't last. Joy does come in the morning. He is with us always and through all things. And even when we don't understand what stuff we are made of, he does. And he allows us to go through things that will bring light to every dark place. Hold on, wait on the deliverance that he promises us and know that all things are in his hands. I'm going to read to you from Psalms 91. Whoever dwells in the shelter of the Most High will rest in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, he is my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. Surely he will save you from the fowler's snare and from the deadly pestilence. He will cover you with his feathers and under his wings you will find refuge. His faithfulness will be your shield and rampart. You will not fear the terror of the night, nor the arrow that flies by day, nor the pestilence that stalks in the darkness, nor the plague that destroys at midday. A thousand may fall at your side, ten thousand at your right hand, but it will not come near you. You will only observe with your eyes and see the punishment of the wicked. If you say, The Lord is my refuge, and you make the Most High your dwelling, no harm will overtake you. No disaster will come near your tent. For he will command his angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways. They will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. You will tread on the lion and the cobra. You will trample the great lion and the serpent. Because he loves me, says the Lord, I will rescue him. I will protect him for he acknowledges my name. He will call on me and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and honor him. With long life, I will satisfy him and show him my salvation. Let's go ahead and go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, God, we love you. Mm. And Paul encourages, commands, tells us to examine ourselves. So Heavenly Father, right now we do that. We examine ourselves. Father, any... Um, thing that might be on the inside of us that ought not to be there, Father, we repent. We ask for your forgiveness. We, uh, we, uh, we, we say, Lord, wash us of all of our sins. Make us worthy to be able to partake of this communion, this covenant in your honor. I thank you for your purity. What was purchased for us 2,000 years ago today, what we celebrate, we thank you for it, Jesus. The word of God says that on the night he was betrayed, that he took the bread and he broke it. He said, this is the bread of my body that is given for you. And as often as you take this, eat this, do this in remembrance of me. You may take the bread.
and he took the cup after supper. And he says, this is the cup of the new covenant. My blood that is shed for you for the remissions of your sins. Father, we thank you for the broken body and the shed blood of your son given for us so that we might have that sozo, that sotore, that salvation. In Jesus' name, amen. You may take the cup. Paul goes on to say that as often as you eat of this bread and drink of this cup, you declare the Lord's death until he returns. My friends, he is our soon returning king. And we celebrate today his life, his death, his burial, his resurrection. We celebrate his ascension. We celebrate the birth of the bride of Christ that we have been given the opportunity to be a part of today. Let's close in prayer. Heavenly Father, we love you today. And God, we bless you. We thank you for the resurrection of your son. This resurrection that gives us life, gives us salvation, purchases righteousness for us. We seize those gifts and we thank you, God, for them today. Father, I speak a blessing over each person who's attending today. I say, may the Lord bless you. May he keep you. May he cause the light of his countenance to shine upon you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen, amen. I want to thank you for being here with us today. I say, in the name of Jesus, go enjoy the rest of your Resurrection Sunday. Celebrate. Have a good day. We love you, Lord. What is it? Oh, yes, 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 yes. Uh, Remember to meet in the foyer in about 15 minutes. Um, You should see the link as part of the comments. Um, So just click on that link. Do the prompts. Do what you got to do and meet us in the foyer. I look forward to seeing you in just a couple of minutes. I love you. Have a great day.